now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I, my name is Catherine McCall. I want to welcome everybody to today's um, broadcast here and webinar series for Life in the Deep Sea. Uh, today we're going to be featuring Canyon Predators. Um, we're really excited to have you here uh, today to share a little bit about our Mid-Atlantic Ocean um, as part of this. Before we go ahead and get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, what you see now in front of you, you have um, some of our, both of our speakers, Peter Oster and Mary Cammy, um, as well as Keisha Santiago Martinez and myself at the top. Um, and you can enlarge the presentation as we go through the webinar by using the drag bar um, just underneath or above the webinar um, webcams. And if you want to enlarge the um, people at the top, you can drag it down. Um, what we're going to do to handle questions today is if you have questions, you can enter them into the question box at any time. We're going to be holding questions to the end of both presenters. People will be on mute, all of the attendees, um, except for the presenters um, and the hosts. And we are going to be recording this um, and a link will be sent out at the conclusion to all of the participants. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and kick it over to um, Keisha Santiago Martinez. She is our Deputy Secretary of State for Development Planning and Community Infrastructure with the New York State Department of State. Um, and she is our current chair of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean. Um, so Keisha. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. And good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Management Board of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, Marco, I'm excited to welcome you to the first part of our webinar series on life in the deep sea. Today's webinar, Canyon Predators, will introduce us to some of the unique and fascinating creatures that inhabit the deep canyons offshore the Atlantic seaboard. During the spring, Marco co-hosted A Life in the Deep Sea with Dr. Tim Shanks of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. This now webinar series was inspired by the overwhelming interest coming off of that webinar. And after speaking with our colleagues and partners, we all have a thirst for more knowledge about the discovery, research, and exploration that could ever be covered in just one, but one webinar series. So we turned it into a series. Delighted by this, we decided to hold a three-part webinar to ensure stakeholders got the chance to learn about the wonderful and mysterious world of the deep sea and the unique and surprising species that call it home. I would like to thank Dr. Peter Oster, Research Professor Emeritus of Marine Sciences, and Dr. Mary Kami, uh, Director of New York Seascape, for sharing their expertise with us today. Their research has helped to propel forward our knowledge of how marine species use deep sea canyons throughout their life cycle. I would also like to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their continued support, which has allowed Marco to continue working on collaborative projects like these. Thank you all again for joining us today. We hope to see you at subsequent webinars um, throughout the series. And enjoy. Thanks, Keisha. Thank you, Captain. Uh, yep, and now what we're going to do um, is we're going to go ahead and start off with our first presenter. Um, our first presenter today um, is Peter Oster, and um, for both uh, Keisha and Mary, you're welcome to turn off your webcams at this point in time. And while Peter um, goes ahead and shares his slides um, and leaves his webcam on, um, as Keisha mentioned, Peter is a research professor emeritus um, of marine sciences at the University of Connecticut and a senior research scientist at Mystic Aquarium. He's a marine ecologist and his work is broadly focused on the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity in the ocean. For the past 40 years, Peter's conducted studies to understand how the behavior of marine fishes and dynamics and their patterns of habitat use influence their distribution, abundance, interactions, and diversity across underwater landscapes. From an applied science perspective, his most notable work has really focused on understanding the ecological effects of fishing um, and on developing a scientific basis for using marine protected areas as a conservation tool. His work has spanned the globe where he has served as a scientist or chief scientist on over 60 major research cruises and led um, many shore-based projects. So without um, further ado, Peter, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. Um, uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, uh, and so am I, actually. Uh, that's the problem with PowerPoint, because you can tweak things up until the very last minute, which which is what I did. So today, what I hope to do, or what I plan to do, is uh, take you on a, on a photographic tour of the scope of interactions of species, principally fishes, in uh, submarine canyon landscapes. And over the last 
nearly two decades, there's been an unprecedented series of dives uh, making direct observations in, in these truly known parts of our EDC. And while we can get a, a great deal of fundamental information uh, about uh, communities and species uh, and, their, and their composition and diversity, it's not necessarily sufficient being able to make strategic Peter, your audio is cutting in and out. Um, if you could just um, make sure that uh, the microphone is unblocked. Thank you. Yeah, that there was a. I was getting that from other other people too. Uh, I'm trying to sit as close to the wi uh, to the Wi-Fi hub as I can. Is this any better? That sounds good. Okay, so. Uh, Sorry, so my, my view now is on my stairs down in the basement. Uh, so the, so what I'm going to talk about, so keep in mind, so I'm going to give you a quick tour today uh, of the of, with photographic tour of the, of the scope of interactions uh, that we've observed through uh, uh, many dives in, in this region. But just keep in mind that underwater features, both oceanographic and physical, like canyon walls and corals and other species, mediate encounter rates of predators with prey. That where habitats uh, join, uh, there's enhanced diversity and uh, interactions via effects. Remember from uh, from uh, science classes back in high school, one of the classic examples of enhanced species diversity is 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 at areas where one habitat joins another. Or that's that's called ecotones, and that there are particular oceanographic processes, like prey subsidies, uh, for predators at multiple space and time scales. We like to gain an understanding of the importance of canyon landscapes to rare and transient species that use these places, and of rare habitats and the interactions that they mediate. And then ultimately, uh, think about the idea of using a landscape perspective, along with addressing the associated uncertainties in both research. So there's a, uh, a, a, a diversity of canyons uh, or abundance of canyons along the entire eastern continental margin, starting at Houston Canyon on the eastern side of Georgia's bank on the U.S. side, uh, down to, to Norfolk in the, in the mid-Atlantic region. And, and, and while these uh, uh, major canyon maps show these discrete areas, indeed, the continental margin is a complex series of both shelf and sized and margin uh, canyons and the processes that both form them and sustain them today. Uh, again, canyons are ecotones in the deep ocean. So we've got this entire North Atlantic, Northwest Atlantic basin that impinges along the edge of our continental margin. And submarine canyons uh, exhibit wide, wide depth ranges. They have steep environmental gradients going through multiple oceanographic regimes. They have complex topography. Uh, uh, heterogeneous or complex uh, variation in substrates. They have tidal and impinging currents, and they produce topographically induced upwellings. And so just a, a Northwest Atlantic perspective is there's multiple current And the overlying oceanography is also uh, Patchily distributed. So this is a sea whiffs or, or a coastal zone color scanner image of surface phytoplankton. So the downwelling of primary production into these deep sea environments is not uniform either. So the ecological communities that develop in these places uh, are different, uh, vary across depths, oceanographic and geologic settings. So that contributes to the wide diversity of organisms that live in these places. We understand these organisms at least from early days of oceanographic exploration. This is just an example of the coast steamer Blake that conducted a number of cruises in the late 1800s and early part of the early part of the 20th century using nets and dredges uh, and developed a fundamental understanding of deep ocean ecology. Uh, and while again, this is necessary, it didn't necessarily elucidate the uh, wide range of, of interactions within and between species, as well as related to the landscape in which they sit. William Beebe uh, was a pioneer in developing 
uh, approaches for making direct observations, much like wildlife biologists do on land, of animals in the deep uh, ocean, wildlife in the in the deep ocean. And Mary's going to talk a little bit a little bit about that in the in her her talk coming up. And then in the in the last part of the last century. A uh, wide range of underwater platforms were developed that gave scientists uh, and others the opportunity to again to make those kinds of uh, proximate observations of how animals interact in the wild. Most recently, the Ocean Exploration and Research Program at NOAA has uh, developed a, a, a global ability to, to implement telepresence-enabled exploration with the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer and the Deep Discoverer ROV. Uh, the, the technicians uh, that enable and, and the, the ship people that enable this work uh, are at sea with two principal scientists. Um, this is the operations center on the ship, where all this information is relayed by satellite back to shore. And in the old days, you used to have to go to URI or an interspace center to interact directly with the with the ship and and work as a scientist on each dive. But now we can actually just do it uh, via a high speed web. Uh, sitting sitting at home or in my office, which is a, which is considerably more convenient. But this essentially places our eyes in the sea. So let's look at a, a, the range of kind of interactions that occur uh, in these canyon settings. So canyons and the organisms that live within them can be focal sites for enhancing prey capture of mobile predators. This is a cusk uh, in a grove of, of of bubblegum coral in Baltimore Canyon. But if we look at, take a close up of the uh, of bubblegum corals, they're often occupied by a high density of pandalid shrimp. Um, we generally don't see these other places along the the, uh, the adjoining habitats, and and these and a number of predators are are decapod or crustacean eaters, uh, and so these are logically focal sites for capturing uh, for capturing these animals. The corals provide shelter for the for the shrimp uh, and potentially a food subsidy from the uh, from the materials that the corals produce, but these are essentially feeding stations, drive-throughs, uh, if you will. <clears throat> and that's not the only species that uh, there's a there's a diversity of species that utilize corals and other biogenic structures as habitat. Uh, these are just two images of squat lobsters uh, in a uh, colony of of, of Lophelia in uh, in Beach Canyon, and in deep sea mussels or Acesta, <clears throat> excuse me, in McMaster Canyon. Here you can see the the, the, the squat lobster here. Uh, and even small whip corals uh, are focal sites for important prey like uh, mycid shrimp uh, and caprella uh, shrimp, caprella decapods. Uh, and again, these are, are where prey aggregate and can be feeding areas for mobile predators. And different, this is a black coral uh, here and uh, another octocoral and a, a Financialit or sea pen uh, also aggregates, and we've seen this multiple places, it aggregates uh, small crustaceans that are important prey organisms. And as 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 at least inferential uh, proof of, of these kinds of interactions, there's a number of fish predators that feed on crustaceans in this uh, at this one outcrop uh, with large coral colonies in Norfolk Canyon. And each of the arrows points to a to a different species of uh, fish predator. So again, let's you know the, the concept of ecotones uh, will pervade the pervade most of what I'm talking about today, and so this is a Washington Canyon at around 3,200 or well from 3,200 in the deeper part to 1,500 meters at the shallowest part of the dive. That's this line here, uh, and you can see the steep setting and where it's it's easy to imagine how uh, midwater and seafloor communities uh, interact in this kind of setting. And so this is a, a cutthroat eel uh, that's just captured a lanternfish, uh, which is a, a pelagic uh, fish species or, uh, that uh, uses bioluminescence as camouflage. Uh, but these interact near the seafloor and become uh, and become prey for a diversity of predators. Uh, this is a, a gannatus genus gannatus squid uh, feeding on a different species of lanternfish. A cutthroat eel feeding on uh, short fin squid, uh, uh, deep sea red crab feeding on squid, a, uh, a deep water redfish uh, feeding on a, on a again on a mctophid, and a grenadier searching in a in a 
borrow for something. Uh, but uh, the the sea floor becomes the block blockade or the block for for prey, which makes it then easy, uh, well, relatively easier targets for mobile predators. And as prey intersect with the sea floor, uh, they also scurry to, to, to hide in places. And there are a number of species like this uh, Ophidiate cuskiel here uh, that specialize in feeding along, searching and feeding along edges, uh, looking for uh, for for mobile prey. Oh, and and some animals live in mobile homes, and so their ecotone effect uh, is transient. This is a pincushion sea urchin and a juvenile uh, uh, cuskiel. Uh, that uses this for cover and access to prey away from highly structured environments until it's large enough to escape uh, escape predation. This is in Wilmington Canyon around 1400 meters. Uh, and some animals, again, that we often assume are midwater predators uh, feed on seafloor prey. And this is a short, uh, short fin squid actually attacking a black belly rosefish uh, in, a, uh, in a, a canyon north of Georgia's bank. So while there's consistently interactions of the, in the pelagic realm with the seafloor, vertical migrators, uh, the daily migration of zooplankton and fishes uh, up at night and down during the day, uh, seeking they rise to feed and seek shelter in the depths uh, during the day, varies where these intersect with the seafloor. Uh, and here's in Norfolk Canyon, a dense aggregation of krill and squid uh, several squid feeding on on krill in this in this aggregation. This is a high uh, a high density patch of lanternfish in Hudson Canyon from Alvin from back in 2001. So the presence of these kinds of aggregations are not consistent, uh, and so they they uh, move around both daily and seasonally depending on where these aggregations intersect with the sea floor. These are barracudina. They're small. I call them barracudas of the deep ocean, uh, and they ambush zooplankton crustacean and fish zooplankton and by uh, silhouetting against the, the, the uh, dim light uh, from the surface, but they also ambush prey along the seafloor. And here you can see their, their barracuda-like jaw uh, in this image. Uh, deep, deep water hake uh, do the same thing where, where amphipods and krill uh, intersect with the canyon heads. And even a small octopus with this, what was observed reaching out, grabbing individual amphipods uh, from the water, small crustaceans, bringing them back to the mouth, reaching back out, grabbing another amphipod. So animals exhibit a wide range of strategies for uh, adapting to these kinds of prey resources. This is a, another squat lobster, Galatea crab, and here you can see it's it's captured a krill uh, in its in its uh, claw and a long fin hake. Ran, uh, ran and swam in uh, and grabbed the, the krill right from the from the claw of the crab. There are spatially rare habitats as well, uh, like uh, uh, methane seeps. This is Bodhi seep in about three, well, 350 to uh, 450 meters of water here in the mid-Atlantic. And these are reflections of bubbles coming off the sea floor. This is in a multi-beam sonar. And here you can actually see the trains of bubbles coming out of the sea floor. This is, uh, these are uh, sulfur bacterial mats. And if you look closely at the image, there's a number of fish that are prowling around looking for food, looking for prey. This is a, a dense aggregation of chemosynthetic mussels that uh, live around this, this sea floor seep. And you can see how spatially constrained it was in the multi-beam. Uh, and a diversity of species take advantage of the food resources that are available, because a number of animals intersect with the meth with with uh, methane rich water and die, uh, and others are able to tolerate a particular level. There's you can see hagfish, uh, the small uh, a long thin hake actually uses the shells of the mussels for cover, and here we can see this uh, magic crab that's captured one of the barracudina uh, and and use it and ha having that for a meal. Uh, more hagfish, uh, hunting barracudina, uh, and a number of deep sea fish feeding on krill, uh, euphosids in the water column above the sea. 
And then there are a number of transient predators that come and go from canyons. Uh, so this is a, 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 a yellowfin tuna, uh, likely feeding on either krill or squid that were also observed on, on this dive. Uh, this is just a, a, an orant glacial drop rock uh, on, one of the, uh, on the seafloor in the axis of one of the canyons. Uh, and then all, all of a sudden a uh, Atlantic swordfish uh, at, at hundreds of meters came screaming by and uh, grabbed one of the fishes for, uh, for food. So these, these are transient observations that would just be nearly impossible to see uh, where and how these interactions take place without the ability to go underwater with, uh, with a vehicle. This is a uh, Portuguese dogfish or black dogfish. That's this species here. You can see the eye uh, lit up from the ROV. And these often patrol along uh, precipitous walls in canyons where we often find cat sharks in uh, more gently sloping landscapes, although that's, hard, that's not necessarily uh, a, a, universal, uh, a universal truth. And we thought, you know, long range migrants as well. This is a Greenland shark uh, between Alvin and Nantucket canyons, uh, observed in 2013. Uh, but interestingly, uh, this image is from Barbara Hecker from 1979, a, uh, a uh, Greenland shark in Baltimore Canyon. So we know, the, we know that we're beginning to learn the scope of interactions of species in these kinds of landscapes, but ultimately we'd like to build, it would be useful to build an interaction web and models of how these animals interact at the landscape level, because rates of prey capture, growth, the energetics of living are different in different kinds of settings. Uh, there was a, a recent paper, well, maybe not so recent, 2013, that mapped out the, uh, the keystone-ness of species observed in, this is in a canyon uh, in the Mediterranean. But this kind of approach for being able to understand uh, the role that bottom-up or top-down approaches, or top-down approach, bottom-up or top-down processes affect diversity, productivity, and, uh, and, and, and sustainability of different habitats within these larger landscapes would be a, 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 an exceptional tool for management into the future. Uh, clearly, there's an interest in conservation and sustainable use of these places through the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Program, through international treaty organizations like NAFO and uh, uh, NEAF and the North, Northeast Atlantic, through the Fishery Management Councils, uh, the Mid-Atlantic and New England Councils have both passed deep sea coral amendments and uh, they're updating uh, essential fish habitat, uh, omnibus amendments that affect multiple fishery management plans. Uh, there's continued interest at the United Nations and the FAO uh, in vulnerable and understanding the role and how to approach management of vulnerable marine, vulnerable marine ecosystems. Uh, so the, these discussions and our understanding of these places continue. We really need to be able to, as part of what we do, we need to continue what we're already doing, but as part of what we do, we really need to peel away the surface, be able to understand. Here, I just wanted to let you know, you're now just past 15 minutes. Oh, marvelous, and I'm just about done. I just want to acknowledge all the people that make me look good. Uh, Los Watling, Scott France, Ken Sulak, John Moore, Andrea Quattrini, Emily Dewan, uh, who has uh, uh, worked in my lab, uh, Rick Singer, and everybody else who I've forgotten because I've gotten old. I really haven't forgotten, but I just didn't want to keep listing, listing names. Uh, Oh, and actually, and at the beginning uh, in my second slide, I did want to point out that everything that didn't have an image credit associated with it on here was part of the NOAA Okeanos Ocean Exploration and Research Program. Uh, and uh, hopefully there will be more work to come to better understand uh, these incredible landscapes. Uh, thank you very much. All right, Peter, thank you so much for uh, sharing your presentation and, and your work. <laughs> What we wanted to do now at this point is um, I want to remind everybody, um, please feel free as we're going through this presentation, if you have anything that you want to ask Peter, enter it into the chat or question box. Um, we'll be taking those after Mary's presentation. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to call on Mary to see if you could um, start your presentation, turn on your webcam while Peter is taking his down and turning his webcam off, and we'll come back to both of them um, just after you, uh, Mary. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mary while she's getting set up. 
Uh, Mary is the director of the New York Seascape Program, which is a joint program of the Wildlife Conservation Society's New York Aquarium and the Global Marine Program. It was launched in July 2010 as the first um, Wildlife Conservation Society Seascape in North America, and it really seeks to raise public awareness and take action to conserve threatened marine wildlife and habitats in the New York Bight through field research, conservation policy change, and public outreach. She's engaged um, in some of the projects here, including acoustic and satellite tagging of sharks to better understand their movements and habitat needs in the Mid-Atlantic, involved in policy efforts to ensure a safe place for marine wildlife in New York's busy waters, and a number of other initiatives to build a local New York ocean constituency. Uh, she's worked in marine conservation since receiving her PhD in ecology from Rutgers University, where she studied sea turtles uh, in Costa Rica and Georgia, and has also been uh, has also in the past worked as the assistant director and scientist of Audubon's Living Oceans program. We're really pleased to have you here today, Mary, um, and we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. If you want to turn on your webcam, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and then for all of the participants out there, feel free to type those questions in um, the boxes as we go through. Thanks so much, Mary. You are welcome. So, hi everybody. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, I, I really appreciate be, being asked to participate in this uh, in this webinar. But I have to say that I'm not particularly thrilled about the idea of following Peter because he always has such magnificent photographs. And I apologize up front for the limited color and 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 make, and beautiful photos um, today. So thank you, and I hope you uh, enjoy this. So I am to start with I am not actually a um, a deep sea shark expert, though I've had a lot of experience, as you just heard from Catherine, uh, in shark conservation. Uh, but I thought maybe it might be a good idea that we might start uh, back back historically, a little bit where Peter was talking about, well, with the aquariums uh, and uh, their engagement in deep sea uh, co conservation and, and discovery. Um, so indeed, actually, some of the first uh, studies were done by uh, exploring the depths actually right here in our own backyard by WCS scientists uh, and William Beebe, who you actually see here sitting on his, uh, on his uh, bathysphere. He worked at WCS way back when it was called the New York Zoological Society. And uh, we were still, as an aquarium, instead of being in Coney Island, we were based in, at the Battery Park in Manhattan. Um, he began to explore he was orig originally an ornithologist, but decided that he really was interested in marine studies and began to ex take major expeditions to Galapagos and Bermuda and lots of other places. Um, and, and in 1934, he actually, in this bathosphere, took the de deepest man dive ever to that date, uh, where he was able to descend to, uh, to 22 feet and observe through the little portholes there the amazing life that was uh, that was down there. And he worked with a lot of artists uh, and, and scientists, many of them who are women, who helped to catalog those uh, images. Um, and you can see some of them here. WCF is very fortunate to be able to have in their collection some of these major, uh, the, the, these outstanding uh, drawings that captured for the first time these images new to science. Um, so uh, BB actually called, referred to the canyon as the Hudson Gorge. Um, and he, in 1925, spent four days or so uh, sampling with trawls and various other equipment, pulling up um, amazing uh, wildlife that then he then proceeded to explain and talk about in some of his, uh, in some of his logs. He had a hard time believing that it, it just a scant, as he said, uh, 100 miles from New York City, that he was able to see this most amazing diversity of life. Um, and not only was he an avid uh, publisher of, of his research in scientific journals, he also was uh, very much popularized his work and, and was really somewhat of a celebrity in his time. Uh, his expeditions were very closely co covered by the press and uh, included, you can see here on the bottom right, a story that was written in the New York Times after I think his 1927 uh, excursion into the canyon. Um, in fact, in, in that, in the, around the Arcturus time, I think he was actually 25 uh, articles appeared over that five month period. Uh, introducing the the public in New York to the uh, to the, the these amazing riches in our right offshore, 
so I, I actually venture to say that I think that m more people probably knew about the Hudson Canyon, life in the canyon, uh, respectively, to, back in the 1920s than we do than they do today. And it's great that we have uh, these amazing uh, expeditions and fantastic images that Noah's putting together to help reconnect uh, people like right here in our own backyard to these these astounding habitats. Um, one of the first studies that may, that actually uh, I'm going to go back a second that actually um, uh, BB uh, discussed on his on his one of the first collections. He brought up a number of uh, of sharks. This here is a dusky shark, and he wrote in his log that they were able to catch three of these within a half hour. Um, and as a matter of fact, as he said, uh, we had a steak for one um, for, uh, for lunch. The crew was vastly disgusted at the idea, but but they couldn't explain why. Um, and these sharks, although very prevalent now, are among the most threatened uh, sharks in our waters, uh, have been, have, having been depleted by almost 80% over the last 50 years. Um, so in, in talking about sharks, this kind of brings me back to where I'm, uh, I wanted to be on uh, talking about our deep sea shark fauna. Um, so we touched, so here's what I'm going to try to cover today in a little bit of time that I have. Uh, we just talked a little about the historical uh, exploration of our local canyons. Um, I'm going to, I don't know who really is on this webinar, so I want to step back and give you a little bit of an introduction to the uh, biology and ecology of cartilaginous fishes. We'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into looking at some of the uh, the uh, traits and the and the uh, distributions of deep water uh, sharks, and um, we will also I have a, hopefully have time to look at some of the research that we're doing very locally, uh, tracking the movements of sharks in our local waters over over the canyon, over the shelf edge, and and just mention some words about conservation. So. Uh, when we say shark, what are we talking about? Most people just, a shark is a shark is a shark. Actually, sharks consist of quite a diverse group of animals. Uh, there are over 1,200 species that have been uh, been described. Um, and sharks basically are in the uh, class chondrichthys, which are the cartilaginous fishes. So there are 1,200 species of them. We're broken down into a number of groups. The sharks, which are typical animals that we were used to seeing, right? Um, uh, that we're used to thinking about as being uh, one of the major predators of the ocean. Then there are the batoids, which are actually the skates and rays, uh, closely related, dorsally flattened sharks in some regards, and then a very odd and unique uh, group of animals called the chimeras or rat fishes. To collectively, when we talk about, you may have heard the expression elasmobranchs. Elasmobranchs refers to the grouping of sharks skates and rays. So if I use that term today, you'll have a little bit of an understanding about what I'm uh, talking about. And um, these these animals are um, differentiated from the uh, bony fishes of the world, the teleos, by a number of traits. They all have cartilaginous skeletons. Um, they have naked gill slits. Uh, meaning they don't have an operculum or anything that covers their gills, and all are known to uh, reproduce through internal fertilization. As a group, they are uh, very much constrained by the fact that they grow slowly, they mature late, and therefore they have very low reproductive potential. So this is th this is a constraint um, that we will see even uh, greater as we start diving deeper into uh, some of these species. Now I mentioned that there are 1,200 species of. of I'm gonna, I'm, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna. When I talk about any of these animals, I'm gonna just say sharks, unless for some reason I'm specifically talking about some of the other groupings. Um, so there are approximately 1,200 species of uh, cartilaginous fishes, but compared to bony fishes, that's that's rather a quite small diversity. There are almost 30,000 species of described bony fishes, and so the cartilaginous fishes really only account for about four percent of the world's fish uh, diversity. But in that regard, these animals are really very, very um, successful. 
Um, they are they are occur in all the world's oceans and a wide wide range of habitats, and they are. Um, you, you can see here uh, that they are distributed through the continental shelf. Almost 50% of the species that are described come from the continental shelf. Um, some of them are found in freshwater, about 5%. A small similar percent is in, in the ocean, the strictly oceanic. And what's really quite surprising is how many species are considered to be deep water species. Um, so let's, we're going to talk a little bit about these species. When we talk about canyons, and, and this is a little bit, this is this is sort of a personal. When we talk about canyons and biodiversity there, our minds often sort of sink to the bottom. We're dwelling on amazing, uh, the amazing corals, the seep communities that. Uh, Peter had such phenomenal photographs of, and the canyon wall architects. But when I think of canyons and the bio, as biodiversity hotspots, I think of it more in a three-dimensional framework, and uh, a very much like a giant bathtub, where water, uh, with a lot of critters that are spread both horizontally and vertically through the water column. So today, when I'm talking about deep deep water sharks, I'll, and I'll be focusing on the sharks, skates, rays, etc. I'm 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 looking at those in that 3D kind of uh, framework, um, both looking at them from the on the along the the floor of the ocean as well as throughout this pelagic habitat. All right, so here uh, we're able to get visualize that those diverse uh, habitats nowhere near and as beautifully as and, and, and eloquently as uh, Peter described, but the schematic does help us to uh, to see where these things, animals are distributed. Deep water sharks are uh, skates, rays, etc., are defined by animals who spend most of their time or are restricted to depths of more than 200, uh, 200 meters. Um, and this, I think, this uh, report here, it's an IUCN report by Kine and Sinfendorfer from 2007. I think this is probably one of the most complete uh, discussions of uh, the, these uh, 581 species that are known to be uh, or referred to as deep water sharks, skates, rays, cartilaginous fishes. Of those, among the groups, 56% of the of the shark species are considered to be deep water. 40% of the batoids, remember those are the skates and rays, um, are deep water species. And then almost all of the chimeras um, are all, are considered to be deep water. And there are you know relatively few of those, but most of them those live very much. Uh, near the bottom uh, and, and spend more time at the, at, at the base of the of the uh, of the system. Now, um, these, although right now, and this has probably been increasing because as, because we are spending a lot more time exploring uh, the depths of the ocean, we are finding that some of these species are actually. A, a, coming to four every day. We're finding new, more and more species. And just as an example, um, there was a new species named a, a couple of years ago in 2018 that uh, was, was a um, named after Eugenie Clark, who um, was is not one of the most famous uh, shark biologists and therefore has been uh, deemed, given the, the, the title of shark, the shark lady. And this, this uh, Jeannie's uh, dogfish, um, although we had encountered it before, it is because of all lots of new techniques, molecular techniques, ability to get to new places and study uh, the movements, the distributions of some of these animals that we were able to actually distinguish this as a unique species um, right here in the in the Northwest Atlantic. So. This, the scene is always changing. We're learning lots more, we're encountering more species, but we're also know relatively little about the species that we are seeing uh, in the ocean. 950 submarine canyons in the world to be explored. The uh, Hudson Canyon is actually one of the most um, uh, studied and, and celebrated, one of the top, I think, 11 canyons in uh, in the world and yet still we know very little bit about the the elasmo branks and uh, that that exist in 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 these systems so 
um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different groupings based on habitat of these animals. Now, the demersal species are the species that are occurring from that 200 meter mark uh, on the slope all the way, oops, sorry, all the way down, uh, d down to um, approximately 3,000 meters, all right? And Mary, this, just a quick check in, letting you know you have about five minutes left. Oh boy, I'm gonna speed up. Okay, so the demersal sharks are down here on the along the, uh, the benthic, uh, they're demersal or in on the floor as as benthic species, but we also have a group of species, as many of you know, and these are very important species right here in the New York Sea in New York waters that live within the epipelagic zone and all the way down to approximately 1,500 meters. None, no deep sea uh, 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 cartilaginous fish is known to exist below 3,500 meters, and pelagic sharks only extend usually to around. Five, uh, 1,500 meters, unlike the teleos, who are known to actually be able to exploit uh, systems waters all the way down to 8,000 feet. And as a result, that, that restricted di distribution really puts them uh, almost in harm's way, accessible to almost all uh, offshore extraction activities, so for example, oil and gas, and deep water fisheries, making them very vulnerable. Um, so, Life in the deep for these animals is 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 actually quite uh, challenging in some regards, and we know very very little about um, about these animals uh, compared to uh, some of the species that occur more on the coast on in coastal waters. They are, and we don't know even basic life histories. For example, numbers of uh, their fecundity or their uh, even if they have what their life cycle is. Their their age. It's very difficult to age these animals, and because they are so deep in the ocean, we can't really very easily study their migration patterns. It's tough to bring them up alive and tag them. Um, so the work that they're doing in the submersibles, like Peter discussed, is really adding tremendously to our knowledge of these of these of these animals. But because they live in these very cold water environments, they may be very food limited. And as a result, they have very long, even more so than other sharks and, and skates and rays, uh, re, uh, life. Um, they're slower to grow, later to mature, and um, have even more constrained reproductive potential. So as a result, if once these populations are depleted, whether it's from uh, some, uh, pollution or, or extraction, uh, it takes them anywhere from decades to centuries to uh, to recover from those impacts. So now I'm gonna I want to switch a little bit and come a little bit closer to home uh, and focus in on our local uh, right here in our own canyon, uh, the Mid Atlantic Canyon. These are just and again I have a tough time finding these uh, finding um, photographs of these animals, uh, especially those that are in the habitat themselves. But these are some of the species that do occur. Uh, in the Hudson Canyon, including this one that was first described by uh, William Beebe in 1925. And this on the right is a thorny skate, probably one of the most endangered skate, uh, skates in our, in our waters uh, and occurs in the deep sea. We have catfish, we have do uh, do dogfishes, um, and um, according to this um, study by Kiralee et al., uh, we, ha we have approximately 51 species, I think, of, um, of deep water sharks only, uh, and not pelagic sharks, but uh, benthic and demersal sharks described from the Northwest Atlantic. And they have very helpful uh, range distribution maps in there as well. Um, so I, now that we're back in the, in, in the New York seascape, I will talk a little bit about the work that we have been doing at the New York Aquarium to, uh, to study some of these animals in, this, in these 3D habitats. Our work focuses not on the demersal and benthic species, but on those that are, exist in the pelagic, in, in, in the water column themselves, over the canyon and over the shelf break, uh, which includes this magnificent blue shark, um, as well as other species that you that we just uh, would, I just listed there, like makos and whites, and even things like giant pl planktivorous basking sharks. Um, the New York Aquarium started studying the movements of these animals back in 2012 uh, with using satellite and acoustic telemetry. And we wanted to better understand how these animals are using um, th th these, this environment. So we, we did it through uh, tagging work and we're also collecting uh, and performing health assessments. So we have a good baseline of uh, right now of, of wild 
uh, health population, uh, wild animals and how their uh, their health parameters may respond to various kinds of stressors. Uh, these are highly migratory species, so they only come into our waters in, in, in the summertime when it's warmer, uh, either moving up north uh, from the south or uh, from the deep offshore. And um, our, our tags are able to help us track some of these movements. The idea is that if we can better understand what they are doing, we will have a much better idea of helping to conserve them and protect them. So here's my team. I just want to stop and acknowledge everybody up front uh, for all the phenomenal work that they do, Ken, and even for some of the fun. Uh, it's really fun. It's hard. It's challenging uh, between funding and weather, et cetera. Um, it's a little bit tough. Um, but we are. Um, it, is a, it doesn't take a village, it takes a canyon to do this kind of work. And these are some of, uh, of the folks that uh, in the last number of years have been really supportive, uh, helping us uh, elucidate some of these, uh, the movements and the, and the health parameters of these animals. These are the species that we've been targeting. Um, the top three are the ones that we uh, have spent and uh, put most tags in and have the most data on. Um, so, um, and you can see some of them here, the blue shark, the mako shark, this is the smooth dogfish. And the one big animal I'm not gonna talk too much about because uh, they are very coastal is the sand tiger shark. We've been tagging them with acoustic tags and observing their movements. When they're up in New York waters, they use our estuaries uh, year in and year out as a as a habitat, I mean, as nursery habitat for their ju for juveniles. So these are some of the toys, and they can be very expensive toys that we use to help track these these animals. And um, I would say that they help us figure out locations of animals, the sh the near t near short and long distance movements of animals, depending on how long the tags can stay in. And we can even look at their temperature and, and depth and pressure in order to figure out what their, uh, their dive profiles are and sort of a uh, uh, vertically move through the, the, the seascape. Uh, which, which tag we use uh, depends on the species that we want to be tagging. So these two down here are spot tags. These are near real-time real -time tags that allow us to track the animal's movement on, on a daily basis, or at least whenever the animal comes to the surface and is able to report its data to a satellite, satellite uh, orbiting satellite. This is a PSAT. It's a archival uh, satellite tag. When we put it on the shark, it stays on the animal and then is, has a predetermined uh, release date which at that time, whether it's two months, six months, a year, uh, then uh, shares the, the uh, data with the satellite and then comes back to our uh, uh, our desk for analysis. Hi, Mary. Just to let you know, you're just a few minutes over. So if you could oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay. up in just a few minutes, right. that would be great. Great. So I will speak even faster. So here we are. This is uh, us tagging our sharks. We depend on the kindness of our volunteer anglers. Um, to get out on the water since we don't have our own vessel. When, the, when we had the shark uh, next to the boat, we were able to uh, put a tag in, uh, do morphometrics, collect uh, tissue samples, uh, ge genetic samples, sometimes even look at it, uh, use a ultrasound to peer in internally and release the shark within about 15 minutes with a little piece of jewelry, uh, either attached to its fin or in its dorsal musculature. Um, we program these to hopefully stay on the animals for uh, as long as possible, usually battery less, you know, up to six months if we can, maybe longer. And we wait, and we wait and we wait until we start getting some data uh, pinging to us from satellites overhead. It only happens when the, when the satellite, actually, the tag actually breaks the water surface, can, can uh, send data to an orbiting satellite, and then down to our computers. And then uh, team members Jake and Hans do a little bit of magic with that data and, be, and turn it into a track like you see here. So this is a, a, a track of a, of a female mako shark that we tagged it, uh, in the summer in August of 2011 or 14, I forget, 14, sorry, that's wrong. And it, we see that this animal actually tra traveled 66 days 
and traversed uh, 2,100 kilometers in that time. About a week after we tagged it, it came to the canyon, spent uh, quite a while in the canyon, and this represents one of the deep dives that this uh, this tag was able to tell us about. This uh, this animal uh, took a dive down to about 100 meters, uh, it probably in search of prey. Here we have added a few other tracks of the animals that we, uh, the makos that we have been tagging. Uh, almost all of them are juveniles. And what we see here is that two, two things. First of all, every, every one of them seems to spend some time in the canyon or on the shelf break, some more than others. And in addition to that, the patterns are very different. Um, no, no two animals are really doing the exact same thing. But all of them are getting out into deep waters and, and over, over the canyons, which means that they are uh, spending a lot of time uh, in waters that we know are highly productive for, uh, for lots of other species, including those of uh, H, uh, HMS species. This is a, it shows a number of uh, e e species uh, and their EFH uh, in and around the canyon, but it also puts them in, uh, in, in, in well reach of areas like in the, in, the, in the canyon where there's potential for oil and gas development. So being that, that it cannot dive that deep, it's, these animals are always within the reach of fisheries or some other kind of extractive activity. Uh, there is no refugia for them necessarily deep down in the canyon. So uh, in closing, let me just uh, share with a, couple, uh, a few uh, th thoughts with you. Uh, as I said, new species are being discovered all the time. Uh, half the world's species of sharks, ray, uh, skates, rays, and, and chimeras are actually deep water species. Um, and uh, more information is needed to, uh, to understand their ability to uh, sustain fishing pressure, their, their ability to uh, rebound from other kinds of impacts. They have exceptionally low reproductive rates, much lower even than other sharks and rays. And um, as, as such, that makes them, you know, ten, their recovery periods are on the order of uh, many decades to centuries uh, um, once they've depleted. Maximum depth is to about 3,500 meters. They are very making them susceptible to other anthropogenic uh, impacts. Satellite telemetry is a key tool for studying some of these animals, so it's very difficult to get animals, uh, to tag animals uh, down down in the depths, some of the benthic and dermosal species. That's uh, just starting to happen now. And clearly we need a much greater investment in the conservation of these species um, and, and help to identify the hot spots where they spend their time. And finally, let's just circling back to the beginning, uh, I wanted to say that aquariums have been playing an important role in shark research and policy for and, and building stewardship for these much often misunderstood species for over a century. And with that, I'd like to invite you to the aquarium. We are now back open and in business. Um, and there you can learn a lot more about uh, Kudrickians, canyons, and conservation. Thank you for indulging me a little extra time. All right, thanks so much, Mary. And um, if Peter is still on the line with the last five minutes that we have here, um, we have a couple of questions we'd like to pose um, back to, to you guys. Um, and I'll start with the, the first one. And I think it's something interesting. Both of you alluded to the entirety of the ocean space. Uh, Peter, you mentioned interactions at the landscape level and Mary at the 3D ocean space. Um, I was wondering, maybe we'll start with you, Peter. Can you share a few of your thoughts about how we start to tease apart those large ocean space issues and, and patterns? From an ecological perspective? Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, so we need, we need to be able, we need to, to uh, uh, develop the capacity, both uh, both vehicle, you know, ships, ships and other platforms uh, and, and sustained funding for sustained observations in places that we would uh, term, uh, uh, we would so select particular habitats or elements of the landscape, multiple ones in multiple canyons in order to collect sustained observations to understand uh, the dynamics of both the oceanographic regime, how animals move within those landscapes and, uh, issues, about, uh, and issues about connectivity uh, and recruitment. 
and that's across the, the, the diversity of, of organisms. Sentinel sites is what I was is the word I was I was searching for. Uh, we've talked about that uh, for multiple decades on the shelf, and we need to just extend. Uh, and we've been doing that with some uh, ocean observation networks. We just need to extend this uh, down our continental margin. Any thoughts on that, Mary? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how we, who's trying to think about a little bit, maybe some new tools uh, to uh, help differentiate these movements and patterns of distribution through space and time. For example, the use of uh, eDNA meta barcoding now to try to see if, you know, t paired with more uh, traditional. Uh, sampling techniques, we may be able to get a get a handle on that with a lot less uh, co lot fewer cost, less effort. Okay. Um, I was wondering, um, are uh, what strategies um, do predators like swordfish or sharks use to really find prey at the sea bottom where there is no light? <laughs> yeah. So you know, I don't really know a whole lot about it, but let's. But you know, sharks are less uh, less so are um, are visual predators and more depend on uh, other senses uh, like movement and uh, and smell. And so I suspect that those in when there is no light are even more highly developed in some of these species than they would be, for example, uh, in coastal and, uh, and pelagic species. Yeah. So so yeah, exactly like just Mary said, smell and sound. Uh, we just published a paper that included genies dogfish uh, <laughs> uh, about that that uh, described a food fall off the South Carolina coast where it was, it had to have been you know, certainly a fresh swordfish laying on the seafloor and there was already 11 or 12 uh, rough skin and genies dogfish on that had, you know, stripped off a lot of the, a lot of the muscle tissue uh, and it had to have been within, uh, we came upon it with the ROV, we, this was an Okeanos, uh, uh, dive with Deep Discover um, within hours of its of its uh, of the swordfish's uh, sad fate, uh, and and those animals didn't smell. They had to have come from a long distance based on the densities that they normally occur at, and it had to have been one starting to feed, and the sound of of uh, of of feeding of those large fishes uh, had to travel through the water to attract others, and it mm. just becomes a cascade. And we we see those kinds of things in shallower water too. Yeah. So that you know that that they wouldn't happen in the deep, in deeper parts of the ocean is it you know it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Okay. Um, and I want to um, just take a moment. Um, I believe we have a poll um, up that we uh, let's see. Let's flip that over to that. Um, we wanted to, um, and maybe while we go ahead and I'll just say a couple of things in closing, but please take a moment and do complete the quick poll here, which other topics for webinar interest you. Um, there's a couple of uh, answers there, please select one. Um, and just in, in closing, just really want to thank uh, Peter and Mary um, and all of your research partners at the New York and Mystic Aquariums and Yukon. Um, as well as uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for continuing to support Marco's work and for the Mid-Atlantic States and, and all of the participants today for tuning in. Um, just to remind you, uh, we made a recording of this and that link will be sent out to you afterward. And um, just uh, wanna thank you again and really appreciate your time today, both Peter and Mary and all of the rest of the participants. Thank, 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 you, you, for, uh, thank you for having me. Yes, thanks.